It's fill or kill time. It's uh, 3rd of February, and uh, Ed Matz is here with me. It's uh, post um, uh, some uh, football game thing. And uh, <laughs> before we. Before... How to make friends and influence people. Yeah. You, you do yourself to so many people when you. Uh, I know you do it tongue in cheek when you uh, <laughs> take the mickey out of soccer or even American football. But do you want to hear, so for people who don't know what you're talking about, uh, I've, uh, I've taken, a few times I've said that I, I uh, or I made fun of football or football, well, it's football on both sides of the Atlantic. And um, a lot of people get pissed off from this. But my, my point is just, I want to use my mental energy on other things than sports. And I had a, a proof of this this weekend where my parents were visiting and I was watching skiing and I could feel like how much I got emotionally involved just by this like one time. So, so I'm like focusing my energy. On cross country on. skiing as well. No, it's exciting. It was sprinting. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> no, it is. It is. It's, I, I thought she, I, I think I replied to you at the time that anyone who's got had five kids uh, and sat at six o'clock in the morning watching trans world sport, I've seen every sport there is, including beach volleyball. Yeah. Um, cross country skiing. But smart, you watched, but, uh, uh, you watched, uh, the football game. Uh, again, you have to define that. Arsenal beat uh, Crystal Palace, squeak through. It's always a nervous <laughs> moment for me, being a gooner. The other football game. Uh, the other one, the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking to a Bears fan. Um, I luckily spent a whole season watching the Bears. So, um, uh, yeah, I like American football. It's a great sport. In fact, I played... Um, I love sports, very. You'll get me started on completely the wrong subject. No. I'm used to play... You know, I still do play sport. Um, I go running, uh, try to go running as much as possible but I played quite a bit of tennis played last night I always play these young Turks who want to hit me off the court which is fine they never realize they can beat me by drop shotting so I can just hit the ball and I can burn some energy in the excesses of um, the week out that way um, but I love um, you know I love sport I love American football and soccer and it's kind of I think being healthy being fit from a, is quite important a healthy mind comes from a healthy body so I think sport and trading do go hand in hand as a discipline as an approach physical approach together but I also think there's some analogies from a trading perspective which is what I wanted to talk about today but uh, yes I saw um, saw some of it I was a bit busy uh, yeah. but it was great yeah, I, have, I have one question of... before we go into sports because something happened this morning uh, in Japan and it's an interesting point maybe or boring maybe so Nikkei entered a uh, correction, temp over 10% correction year to date. Do you care about these sorts of things? Yeah. <coughs> I'm long, Nick, I say. Yeah, I care. <laughs> Do I care? <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm long from, I'm long from uh, 2011, so it's a kind of long-term position. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, but then you're way up. So, uh, no, I'm just wondering if this is, um, is this an indicator that matters or is it just good for headlines? It, Nikkei, no, it's very important, sorry, because um, there's a whole correlation basket going on here between um, the Nikkei, just whack up, I mean, it's a shame you sprung that one on me because if you put up a Nikkei and a dollar yen or yen charts, you'll see that they've been moving in sync. And what has been... Um, what is also interesting is the Nikkei is, is, is part of the risk basket, is actually also correlating, I think it's correlating with some lags and leads uh, with the um, S&Ps as well. So I actually think um, the Nikkei is a bit worrying. Um, not, I don't think, well, it might be worrying the real short term um, <coughs> to people, but I, I think it's supported here. But my, my question is more what it's going to do probably the... Um, the next uh, after I think it will recover I think all the markets are set to recover and today's an yeah. opportunity I've seen saying that for a week now but it keeps rallying and dead cat bounces and coming back uh, Nikkei's pushed a bit lower I pushed put up a chart of Nikkei and dollar yen um, yeah. two year chart yeah. any particular you want no that's fine I mean it's been nice to overlay you can see they're moving in sync yeah um, and if you the, can't see the, the chart, um, turn on 720p, um, please. The is lagging, the Nikkei today. Yeah. Uh, it seems that they uh, they did uh, separate a little bit about a year ago, so... No, they didn't. Okay. They might look it on your chart, but they, okay. they didn't. Uh, they've been taking turns, which one's leading the other, um, and it looks like 
arguably the Nikkei's leading dollar yen on the yeah. day. Um, but it's related to, um, it has an impact, it's sort of correlating with the other markets as well. Yeah. Um, but the other markets look arguably safer. Yeah. You know, I think, um, take something like the DAX. I mean, uh, DAX, I, I, I think, is uh, personally, I'm buying into this. I would like to squeeze it down one more time. Uh, Friday was kind of one of those typical things. Uh, Friday was an opportunity to lighten on Wall Street. It was funny because we were talking um, before about how I not only did um, about this uh, experience, this incident on Friday when I was finished for the day, market was ticking up. I was done. I was upstairs setting up for a, we have a film night. Um, uh, in fact, I watched Rush. It was pretty cool. Was it good? Yeah, really good, really good film. I'd recommend that. It was more interesting because it's being billed as James Hunt's, is, um, you know, the story of James Hunt. It was a story more about Nicky Lauder, in my opinion, but or their rivalry. But anyway, set up for that. And then um, and then I saw where the Wall Street was. It was just around, just below uh, 15,800. And so I thought, oh, this looks toppish. It's on, on a Friday in a close. People aren't going to want to hold this. So I... I sold it and whack. I don't know who was doing what. I think someone was playing around with a wire on a DVD player, but whatever. I had a power cut. Oh, yeah? And then the next thing I know is, is Vinci um, got it back up, everything running, because I wasn't expecting the trade. And the Dow was 30 points low. <laughs> <laughs> so as a result, I closed, the, you know, closed my position out. Thank you very much. And then um, I closed it out. And then this morning, uh, on that particular computer, it was on my my laptop. And I move around the house. Um, I opened it, up, I pressed the button, opened it up, and the um, it, it cashed. And my position was still there, it was the one I closed out, and it was saying just showing me how much I would have made had I run that position. <laughs> you know, and That's he's just all right, fine, thank you. You know, maybe I shouldn't have watched the film. Or maybe I should have, you know, spent the whole weekend worrying about position in order to make you know, 150 points, whatever, rather than, than 50 points. Um, but that's not the point. The point is, um, you know, that's I took a trade for a good reason and it worked. I uh, had a good risk return and thank you very much. I can bag it, move on to the um, to the next trade. Yeah. That's kind of, um, is also a theme of today because it's not just about sports, but it's being able to see that you're in it for the long run. Yeah. Um, I have an analogy I want to run by you in that. You know the the speech from um, uh, from that uh, any given Sunday when he talks about uh, that's the game of inches and it's like yes you missed that big uh, move and it's annoying because you see what you would have made but don't you think that uh, the real way you make uh, you make your dues as a trader is by by winning in the game of inches, you take an inch. You take an inch at a time. You you never go for a yard at a time. You always go for an inch at a time. You know what I mean? Um, I, we've kind of alluded to that before. I'm a, I believe in um, diversification, you know, of risk, um, not just in markets, but also um, time spans and also types of trade. I trade a lot of. Um, I trade quite a few of the indices short term. Um, because I, I regard it as a bread and butter. You know, there's no, you know, I might be wrong, but I can still make 30 points um, trading here and there and everywhere. Um, and that just is one element of my trading. So that would be my inches. And whereas, I, you know, at the same time, I may be trading around an attempt at a home run. Uh, yeah. It's either way, it's a long innings. And there's lots of ways in, in sport and in trading of being successful. You can either. Um, you know, you can go for the home run, or you can just, uh, just sneak all the time. Um, yeah. It's just, um, or you know, you can go for the bomb. Or you know, since the Super Bowl yesterday. Um, or in fact, if you want to talk about the first few minutes, you can go for a safety. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is, uh, it's all about how you, what your system gives you strengths for, and what you're good at, and if you're good at defense, like um, Seattle. Clearly, yeah. well, yesterday, then you can make some, you can make some money, but you can also, um, you know, in that case, they, they kind of set the whole game up um, yeah. for themselves by that by that start. But also, they, um, 
it's just different ways of making money and, and uh, taking opportunities. And I believe in, in trying to diversify because that way, if I'm wrong on one market, which I am on uh, the yen at the moment, I have been young, wrong, then there's plenty of other similar markets um, I'm doing really well at. Um, you know, Euro, for example, is broken down just to stop people up coming back up, cable, the same thing. All these markets, uh, Aussie actually going the other way. There, you know, there are other opportunities, different perspectives, different time perspectives, different ways of making money, skinning the same cat, if you like. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, when you put it all in the melting pot, the idea is obviously to be um, making money slowly but surely because it is a slow process. I mean, that's and that's, you know. Um, so I put that's, out that's the first quote you sent me today. Uh, it's quite fitting for what you just talked about. From Paul Tudor Jones. Now, do you want to read it out? Uh, I sure can. Uh, the most important rule of trading is to play good defense, not great offense. Yeah. I was kind of saying two things there. One is his that point about preserving your capital. You know, first and foremost, worry about protecting your your capital because you know if you take a hit, take a loss, then it's harder to regain. You know, it's one of those obvious things, but. Um, people forget it's harder to make the money back than it is to to lose it in the first place. Um, so you know, preserve your capital first and foremost. Assess what type of risk is out there in the trade you're taking, and whether the probabilities are in your favour. Um, you know, first and foremost, protect your, your your capital. And the other thing is, from a a defence point of view, is is you just got to be solid and, and pick pick the moments. You know, if you go out all out in every market, you think it's going up there, it's going down there. You know, you're going to trade this, going to trade that. Where hey, this today may not be the day. You know, it's it's uh, a great offense actually requires a, a great defense to give you the confidence to do it in the first place. So um, today coming in, it looked like the uh, DAX, for example, again a market I trade particularly in the mornings. I, I, I focus. I don't know if people realize this or notice this, but I focus on markets like DAX first thing in the morning and, I, and currencies. I focus on currencies all the time. But also um, then come the afternoon, the DAX typically slows up and just does what Wall Street, or used to do what Wall Street does, not anymore, um, and then focus on Wall Street. You know? And that way you know, I'm looking, to, looking for various opportunities. But what I'm trying to do is pick my moments. Um, and it all comes back to the same point about being solid and waiting for for the opportunities. And it's funny how a lot of these people talk in terms of sporting analogies. Um, you know, put up the, uh, there's a Warren Buffett. Yes, sorry. A Warren Buffett quote there. Um, Do you want me to read it? To integrate yeah. a little bit here? In this game, the market has to keep pitching, but you don't have to swing. You can just stand there with your uh, with the bat on your shoulder for six months until you get a fat pitch. Yeah, which is, that's right. The market's always pitching. There's always opportunities in a market, and they vary. Um, and you don't have to swing. Now, you know, if you're um, if you're say a spot trader in a bank, and your your job is to trade euro dollar, and um, someone you know phones up or whatever doesn't phone up, but you've got a position given to you, then you have to swing. You can you know, manage your way out of it, etc. But in terms of because uh, he's more of an investor, but even from a trader like myself is you know, I trade short term, but I tend more to be a swing trader. But then I don't have to swing. I can wait for the moments. Um, and occasionally there is that fat, op, f um, you know, the fat pitch. There is the big one. And people will know if they follow me, certainly on Market Vision TV, well, uh, a trade we took um, called the fat pitch trade. I called it the fat pitch trade in intentionally on Dollar Canada. Because for me, it was once in a, almost a generational trade, once in a 10-year opportunity for Dollar Canada to do something special. Um, you know, and you don't need to trade Dollar Canada. Uh, a lot of people found it difficult because it's very quite erratic. It is quite clearly. I've got a great chart, 250-year chart on Dollar Canada. You won't get it from there. Um, uh, on... Um, because uh, it's way beyond the scope of any any trading horizon 250 years, showing that there's a long-term equilibrium point of parity. So why would you ever want to stick and hold a position away from parity? Because it will come back, and it will. But every now and then it does something major. Uh, what we've called, what I've called, a paradigm shift, 
which is why we've got the uh, uh, the fat pitch, um, fat pitch trade. Yeah. So, so I mean, your, uh, uh, by the way, you should promote football. your service a little bit more. Uh, guys, yeah, I'm not, putting it up yeah. here. Yeah, oh, it's very kind of you, but um, well, no, this... but you should. I mean, you don't have to like hawk it all the time, but I'm just showing one of the the video. So I think it's a great service. Uh, you you don't talk about it nearly enough, I think. So. Um, yeah, but that's the nature. Though. I'm, a, I'm a trader, not a salesman. Um, people might disagree with that, but that's not my, you know. There you go. There you are. I believe, again, in, I believe in diversifying what I do in terms of my revenue streams, in terms of my perspectives, yeah. uh, in terms of my, my, my trading as well. If you go back, go, um, if you move on to the next, uh, there's another Warren Buffett quote about baseball. Yes. There you go. <clears throat> which I think is, is quite ironic in many ways. You want to read that out as well? The stock market is a no-called strike game. You don't have to swing at everything. You can wait for your pitch. The problem when you're, you're a money manager is that you can't, your fans keep yelling, swim, swing, you bum. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's, that's a great quote, actually. Yeah, and slightly, why well, is it in character, slightly out of character, but I think it's funny how, uh, well, I don't know what it's like to work, work obviously, for Warren Buffett, but um, uh, he's a very shrewd guy, but, you know, uh, we talked before about people with money, it's easy to be shrewd, it's easy to, to give money when you, um, I actually tweeted something to that effect. Oh, I took the, um, the great, um, oh, what's his name, the Wolf on Wall Street quote, I just love that. Um, on the weekend, I saw that film as well. I wasn't going to see it, but my son insisted <laughs> I saw it because my wife was away, whatever. And it's about uh, money can uh, buy you a better life, can buy you cars, great cars, buy you a few other things as well. Uh, but actually money can make you a better person uh, because it allows you to give generously to good causes. And if you're, um, which is very true, it is true, uh, which is, it says so many things as well, quite nastily patronizing as well but when you're Warren Buffett you can you know you can do that um, and it's a great position you know good for him good for him that he's, he's able to do what he does um, but he's also in, in a position um, now where he doesn't necessarily have to swing because he sits back and waits for his opportunities uh, whereas a lot of people out there you know they start trading and there's quite a few people I know on Twitter for example who have to swing because if they don't swing they can't pay their rent yeah. And, you know, so it's nice to hear people like Warren Buffett, clever people, done well, you know, pontificate and say some interesting things. But, you know, they're often a step away from reality. Yeah. So that, when, that's interesting. Uh, I never heard anyone say anything negative about his quotes. And I'm not saying it's negative, but it also it is kind of easy to sit there after 40 something years of, uh, of returns and just uh, talk about how great you are. But the, the reality of the fact is that Warren Buffett hasn't had great returns in the last 10 odd years and uh, most of his returns came like many money managers in the past uh, I, I, I I don't know um, yeah I mean that may be the case Barclay Hathaway seems to be doing alright he seems to you know money breeds money um, yeah. when the, you know, the, the US government turns around and says do you want to buy some of these assets they're cheap we need you, we need you to buy them and he goes and buys them, and lo and behold, the market does recover, and he's been given a great opportunity at something to buy something very cheap. Then, you know, money buys money, money buys position, and might buys you. It's kind of like you know that mantra I use: trading from strength. If you're trading from strength, then it gives you greater opportunities. If you're able to sit back and not chase markets, you don't have to trade euro dollar, you don't have to, um, you know, get your rent today. Then you don't need to trade today. But even in the course of any one day, there's going to be an opportunity later. That is one thing I've noticed, particularly on, on Twitter and particularly in the retail market, is a desire to is that everything's here and now. Like in the market, it's it's the euro is breaking down. It must be here and now. And lo and behold, it doesn't go down, and it goes sideways for a day. And it's not you know the view of it going down isn't necessarily wrong. It's just the it didn't have to be here and now. Uh, the fact that something's not going up doesn't necessarily mean it's going down. Um, again, talking about Paul Judah Jones, I quoted him on the weekend as well, saying um, markets go uh, uh, markets only trend for fifteen percent of the time. They go sideways uh, sideways for eighty five percent of the time. Mm. Even if a market's in trend, it will sit there, and then you know it will trend only for short periods, 
and then consolidate again, moving from one equilibrium point to another. And if you look at volume charts, you'll see that a lot of the volumes of business goes through in consolidation periods, people anticipating the next move rather than the moves themselves because they, they happen so so quickly. Well, and that's where I think, you know, I, I, I love sport, um, but I think personally I found sport so helpful to me in a number of ways. One is, is the stamina, physical stamina. One is the mental stamina as well. In you know, in any one game, you can be losing and know that you've got a chance later to get that back. Um, and, and you keep plugging away and you keep plugging. You know the game's not finished until the final whistle. So it gives you a determination and perspective. But it also knows that there will be times when you, you don't play well, when you don't trade well. But you know that doesn't mean you're a bad trader or a bad sportsman. You know, it's just... Um, Look at Torres, you know, went for pretty much a whole season without scoring a goal. That's a bit harsh, but um, great player, great forward. He's a Chelsea guy, so I'm not going to praise him, and ex-Liverpool, so I'm not going to praise him too much. But he went through a really sticky patch, but he came good in the end. Uh, and it's, it's, it didn't, you know, the fact you don't score a goal today or this month doesn't mean you're not a great striker. It just means you, you just need to maintain belief, which is what he did. It was quite clear that he's just stuck to it, stuck to it, and people backed him. Yeah. And you came through. And the same with trading. If you've got a system that performs well, then unless the fundamentals of the market are so different in a sustained period that's going to undermine your model, then the chance is just a blip and that you yeah. don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to rethink. If, however, you think the conditions, let's say um, your model is based on, on indicators that do well in in ranging markets and yet you go through a period of sustained trend let's say you're a yen trader and you you're making a killing when it's below 80 because it was doing nothing and then suddenly breaks into trending you're 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 losing money but also not only are you losing money but your model is wrong because it's in a trending market then in those instances you need to rethink what you're doing and the hard thing is to recognize is it still a trending market obviously all these things are easier to say than than do but it's main it's maintaining perspective that you are a good player, that your model is right, or you're maybe time to hang up your boots and uh, your model isn't right and you need a new model. Maybe they needed to get rid of Suar um, Suarez. That was a bit of ironic, tongue-in-cheek comment. Um, <laughs> uh, but, or, or Torres even, but they stuck with him and he's come good. And it's a long haul. And I think that's one thing sport teaches you. But an inter interesting point what you're making about uh, Torres and football is in general. Because I think that uh, footballers, it's such a mental game. And uh, they're all about equally skilled uh, athletes. But the, the one thing that can really differentiate them is how their mind works. And uh, first of all, I, I guess uh, you just have to not think so much and trying to act on muscle memory. But sometimes that's harder than it seems. But also you have to use a little bit untraditional method. So I want to bring up a chart here. Uh, on your left, it's um, it's a chart of EM flow, and it's from Bank of America uh, via Structured Research, and uh, I just find it interesting that um, uh, to use flow as a contrarian indicator. How do you like to use these things? Because I don't hear you talk about stuff like flow ever. So I'm just like, again, I'm springing it a little bit on you, but. Uh, extreme. Well, I flow. use flows. No, I do believe in flows um, very much. So it's all part of sentiment, but it's also um, where you are within a trend. When you get real flows, when you get m people taking money out of the market, they're not going to put it back. That's a real flow. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in the real, in what I describe um, as real money. But I mean, money is money. But in that instance, it's the real flows um, because they they highlight an underlying fundamental trend quite often as to. Um, as to why I don't speak about them, because I know full well there are people, well, sometimes it's confidential information. You know, working in banks, I remember on many occasions seeing serious flows, but you'd be in serious trouble also if you go and tell someone specifically that someone, you know, someone was doing something else, you know, doing putting through trades through. Um, sometimes can no you problem. Can you like elaborate Goldman, on this? Goldman, I mean, remember one of the best trades I never did was because Goldman Sachs sold a yard of dollars in, in dollar yen and I was buying right at the time. I, I just someone said, you just don't do that. Goldman are selling a yard. And I was, you know, I was this, um, I'm not going to say where I was, I was working in a bank, and I didn't do the trade. And what happened? 
later that day, it was a big figure higher. Because was that a flow? Um, no. I mean, I imagine it was Goldman on the... I assumed, one assumed, it was on the back of a real trade, you know, a real flow, maybe some sort of bond adjustment or, or whatever. Yeah. But in actual fact, I think it was just um, they were having a punt and they were wrong. Um, and well, as a consequence, I was wrong because I didn't do it. But, you yeah. know, I'm sure they've, they've made many successful trades but how, since. How so. much flow information do you have now? I don't know when this was, but I, I well, know... Well, that's another reason uh, you don't talk. I don't... I wouldn't talk because I'm not privy to that information all the time um, and therefore I get um, asymmetric information yeah no you're right about that this is more uh -huh. interesting than anything else yeah I mean no no but if that's if that's an aggregate if it's and it's accurate then it's it's useful well my problem is is when someone says you know in that instance Goldman is is selling a yard someone else could be buying you know, uh, buying two yards or buying a yard neutralizes it, and they're buying. The person buying is buying for really good sound reasons that they're going to hold. I mean, it's not having. You know, it's, it's always a balance in how much information you have, and if you don't think you can get all the information accurately, then you start to question whether you should rely on it as an information stream in itself. And I tend not to for that reason, because if I chased, you know, by the time I hear. You know, it was a time when I was trading Interbank or, or whatever, but, you know, Citibank surrounded by brokers and, and good brokers also, you know, giving some good good tips as what's going on. Then, you know, you knew you were one of the first people to hear. Um, by the time I hear it now and, and what I do, you know, it's, it's if I've heard it, then the chances are not everyone else has heard it, but yeah. they, um, it's late. There are some exceptions to that. I... Um, had a whole thing about the, the Swiss franc going back. I, there was some good information flows on the Swiss franc about the before the peg during that process, the intervention process, which was really useful. Um, so you can get some information streams that are interesting and helpful, but you've got to know, trust the source, and not, you know, there's loads of good stories from people like Jesse Livermore about tips, people running in and tips, you know, don't follow them. Um, do you ever follow tips? Ever? Well, what I do with tips, very is if someone comes up with a, a tips, or it's like being tweeted a chart. I'll look at it, take a view, and um, and and you know, and some will be gems. Um, someone um, oh, we talked about on Friday, wasn't it? Um, uh, Singapore dollar. You know, something I I've, I looked at a while back, and I hadn't looked at it recently. Um, but that's a gem. You know, that's a tip. Yeah. I think that's worth looking at, worth following. I think it's a great, uh, great um, trade out there for for the next, you know, during the course of the next year. Yeah. Um, someone found, let's try and think of an example, um, a more recent example. I can't think of a more recent bad example. People come up with some ideas all the time. Um, for me, it's I don't want to hear someone's view. I want reasons for their view. Yeah, you know, exactly. Their views and opinions are to a penny. Uh, reasons for good reasons for a good view. That uh, brings us actually quite elegantly uh, by accident or by design into your next quote from uh, a person I have never heard of before. I, I'll be honest, I haven't heard of him either, but um, and it's a bit surprising because um, Seth Clickenhaus, he uh, runs or ran his own, his own shop. Um, yeah. Clearly, he's been around a few years. Um, yeah. but isn't that great? Look, I mean, I, I don't know how old he is there, but, you know, he's, he's clearly uh, had a background where he hasn't had computers to deal with. But he's now, <laughs> he comes in, probably his walking stick and his, you know, hobbling along in his nice, like, coloured suit and sits down and, and still trading. Yeah? yeah, I mean, what does that Beautiful. tell you? You, he tells you this guy's got oh, I love this quote here. And uh, I mean, this guy is clearly, and he's right about it. You, you make money by being very selective and being patient, waiting for the, those opportunities that are irresistible, where the percentages, percentages are very heavily in your favor. And I think it's, it's brilliant yeah. advice. Yeah, I, I, it is. It's, that's why I wanted to use it. It's one of my favorite quotes of all of all time, if you like, because he's talking about a number of things, about the opportunities that do. You know, you're talking about playing great offense, but it comes from being <clears throat> great defense, sitting there, waiting, waiting, holding off, holding off, looking for your opportunity. And, uh, it, it, you can't make the American football analogy so well, but something like in football you can, or, or in rugby, you wait for the moment. You create the opportunity with the overlap in rugby. 
you know, you tie the packs in, you keep going to the corners, 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 you leave the pitch wide open, and then you've got your extra man at the end for your overlap. You wait, you create that moment, and you wait for the right opportunity. Um, and you're, you're doing it from a position of strength. You're not chasing around saying that we need to try and score every minute of the day. You know, you do that in the last, like England were on the weekend, England-France came. Um, or in fact, France were because they needed to catch up um, and they won in the end, unfortunately. I thought we deserved, England deserved to win that, but they, that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> but Seth is making a, a good point. You trade from strength. Yeah. Try and trade from strength. Even during the day, there will be times when the opportunity, when you're forcing it, Never force a trade, even as a, a day trader, you know, as even as a scalper. It's just you wait for the opportunity, you know, even very, very short term, uh, kind of not trading from the seat of your pants, almost by, by nose, when you, you see and sense people are bailing out. Um, you know, that's the time to say thank you, that's the week stops, um, uh, that's the time to enter a short term trade, which may. Also, if it coincides with a longer-term view, be the time to enter a longer-term trade. So it's it's using, you know, the opportunities that are out there, um, identifying them before they happen. Um, but even even if it's part of your 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 plan, even as it happens during a day, it's kind of, um, you know, there are opportunities. Well, just because you haven't planned it doesn't necessarily mean it's not an opportunity in the real short term. Yeah, uh, but, but this is, I, I find this to be deeply interesting and also very frustrating part of, uh, of trading as a profession or as a full-time gig is how different it is from almost everything else you do. Because uh, in very, a very real sense, you spend about, I mean, it takes about a second to finish a trade or to, to open or close a trade. And it's, yeah. and it's just, it's so easy. <laughs> and it's so incredibly easy to overtrade especially a big move um, uh, especially since i mean someone like seth glick and you know and also warren buffett given their perspectives given the bank it's very easy to sit and do nothing um, because that's their background that's their experience because you gotta you talk these guys started when there weren't computers even um well that's a bit harsh but even trading computers um, and certainly people didn't trade uh, on the internet and now with um, the internet, it's you know it's just a button away, and I can I can risk everything with one one button, and having the discipline not to get overexcited, uh, and that's the hard thing. Again, that's this is I haven't really explained the defense point well enough. You know, uh, Paul Tudor Jones playing great defense. It is the only one who's given up smoking like I did. And, and still don't smoke, will realize that it's not about 90%. It's the 0.001% of the time when you're tempted. That's when you, you, know, you screw up. The same with trading. It's to have defense against your own, uh, own temptations, own emotions. Most people, um, you know, I've been there, and most people, when they screw up, it's not often, you know, even they, they blow their account. It's not because they're consistently bad. It's because one moment they were they lacked discipline. They were caught up in the moment, or or the caught up in a, the larger moment, and and made some bad decisions, and then refused to accept they were bad decisions. You know, you compare one mistake with another. But if you don't start making that mistake by jumping in at the wrong time, by maintaining your discipline, hundred percent of the time, then you can play great defense. And then it gives you a good position to be, you know, to play the great offense and uh, make the trades that that make money. And it's the 0 0.001% 0 0 0 of the time you have to watch, not the 10%. That's brilliant. I've never heard anyone make that comparison. Quitting to, smoking and trading is very similar. <laughs> well, this is, you know, trading is uh, doors on so many things in life. It's so deep, uh, it's so penetrating emotionally, uh, so penetrating intellectually. I find it that way. I, it is immensely penetrating that, that I rely on, um, on other things from other walks of life, you know, even, even politics and stuff like that. I use quite a bit from... Um, and just how I, I, I trade, but particularly sport, particularly sport. Yeah. Um, and it's just a question, so I'm strong enough and able enough to identify the opportunities and take them when I, I, I can. Um, it's like one market today, which is kind of interesting. I've been waiting to do something for, for a while. Can you put up a final chart? There you go. 
I'll see yeah, yeah, this baby. This you see, this is something I've looked at for months. It's a Aussie, um, Aussie and gold, but they're not moving together. For um, gold led Aussie down. You know, the aggressive breakdown through ninety three eighty on, on Aussie was a lag on gold. Gold already broke down through thirteen eighty. That's fine. I never even thought about that. No, in fact, it was higher, wasn't it? But um. Uh, gold led Aussie down, and then they've started switching around, and then Aussie's now leading gold again. Uh, oh, sorry, gold is le leading Aussie. And so we've seen the rally in gold. We've seen gold stabilize, and Aussie's been stayed weak. Now, what we've seen today in the last 24, 48 hours of trading uh, is this chart. You see? Can you see the uh, Aussie's white matching what gold did? What well, gold did last year, actually, there's a big enough difference. Over a month, uh, 598 hours difference between those two charts. Amazing, isn't it? I think it's amazing. I, um, it's all part of fractals and fractal correlations. But what it's saying for me is that Aussie's got a chance to rally on the back of gold, what gold did a month ago. You know, explain that one away. Explain why, you know, are the... Um, are the Chinese, whoever really seriously pumped the um, the Aussie, are they actually uh, eventually realizing there's a correlation with gold, and they think finally that gold is supported and gold isn't going falling down anymore? So they decide to get out of uh, not just you know being gold short, or they started buying gold. They start realizing well, Aussie's associated. We'll buy it at the same time. Is that how it works? I doubt it. So what? How? Why? Why is Aussie lagging gold by? By over a month. I mean, so you think this is a what three-year bottom for the Aussie? No, I don't think that at all. Oh, then I no. misunderstood. No, I don't think that at all. But I think Aussies, um, there's a punt on the upside. Well, that's what my book says. Um, it's a good trade, you know, against the lows. We're looking at quite a few trades, I think, against the lows um, today. Uh, I keep here we go. Just while we've been talking, the um, uh, DAX is ticking down. I want DAX similar again to, um, you know, the New York Open trade, the TikTok first hour. If you can get um, Wall Street again to push low and then fade and, and rally, Mondays is always a good day for a, a turn, Friday, Mondays. In fact, to the extent um, the, uh, the first of anything tends to be quite a good time for a term when someone wants has something to do they'll move a market because they're you know they may, may have decided that they seriously want to be invested in gold in Australia or whatever and therefore do it first off um, in fact well I something I've got out of the habit of doing I'll tweet a chart of what the euro likes to do in the beginning of the month um, that's kind of uh, an interesting perspective or well, what it likes to do in February is even more interesting it's got a, a particular propensity to do certain things in February, which are worth looking out for. But um, so what I'm looking for today down is is one another attempt on the downside, and see that fail, and see a few markets adjust. Um, in terms of any fat pitches out there, there is a fat pitch, and it's one I've taken already. Uh, swing at a fat pitch, and it's Euro sterling. Euro sterling, I think, is. I've done a video on it today called "The Last Opportunity?" Question uh, mark. I have to find it. Um, what's a good sporting analogy equivalent for a UK version of the fat pitch? Well, it's Andy Murray versus uh, what's his name, the Swiss guy. Roger Federer or well, Rink. Yeah, Federer. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rink. I can't say that guy's name. I, I don't. Yeah. Um, how long's Federer gonna last? How much longer is he gonna play? Do you follow tennis? I love tennis. No, um, no I don't think, I think the, the English analogy uh, has got to be cricket, yeah? I mean, forget 2020, we're talking about a Jeffrey Boycott moment, you know, like it is five minutes later and um, Oops. I'm going to have to take that, yeah. See if I get a call on that Should I mute you? Yeah, um, cricket, yeah, waiting for the, <laughs> the full toss. That's what it's about. You know, Jeffrey Boycott waiting for a full toss and taking a single and hogging the, hogging the strike. That's probably more likely um, the Euro Sterling fat pitch analogy. But Euro Sterling could be something special. But you know, did you watch uh, the show before with Live Squawk? 
No, I didn't. Sorry. Yeah, pretty uh, similar. He uh, rounded off by saying, uh, uh, watching the Sterling again as well. It's interesting. There's something else, actually. There's something else potentially very, very sexy on cable. Yeah. Which is, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's like, um, it's the, the right opportunity. Sometimes, you know, you can see uh, something that could happen. But you don't know. You don't really trust it. You don't think the probability is stacked too much in your favor. But how do you trade that? You know, it's waiting for the fat pitch. It's not a fat pitch. The probability isn't right. But you can see something there. And and how do you trade it? Well, you you try and you know you time it right. You get your risk returns right, and then you just build up some P and L on the back of it, so you can say, what the heck? It doesn't matter if it doesn't work out. It's it's a potential home run, a potential fat pitch. I'm going to invest in it because. You know, if you can if you can take uh, ten fat pitches trades in one year, well, let's say twelve, and three of them will come off, and the other nine don't. But if you make you know more than four to one on each trade on the ones that make, you you're up. Uh, I know there there are people who look continually for fat pitches to the extent to the extent they they take eighty percent losses, but when they make they make big. I can't trade that. That puts me too much under emotional pressure, knowing that I've, you know, if you don't make any serious money in the first nine months of the year, then what strain does that put you on if you've got to hit, find a big one? You know, I, I don't also trade year to year in that sense, but if you've got three months and you're down on the year and you've got to find a big, you start, you start putting yourself in a position of weakness where you've got to start swinging even if the pitches are too good. You know, and you might connect, you might not. You might absolutely bury yourself. Not for me. No, I don't trade that way. Uh, I try to identify and I anticipate some big moves and, and trade them accordingly and, and improve the risk return on them. Some of them come off, some of them don't. But, you know, it's um, it's identifying the, the right opportunities at the right moments for the right reasons. You know, easy to say, much harder to do. But Warren Buffett... Seth Gluckenhaus, Paul Tudor Jones, they all did that. And why did and how did they do it? Because they played great defense. Right, I need to get that call. So. Yeah, that was brilliant. And I, I love the the tie in of the sports. It's uh it's a nice little theme for the show. Yeah, well I love sport, yeah. So it's easy yeah. to talk about sport. Not necessarily very well, but if you talk about something you love, yeah. Yeah. It's easily done. So we're right, gonna sorry, be do... doing our research show in about half an hour, so if you want to tune in then um we're yeah, be if you like, let me. I, I can come back, but I, I need to. Oh, there's I a understand. reason. There's something. Um, if I get a call on that phone, there's something. Okay. I go. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks Ed. So.